Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're bringing to light a topic that may be happening in your very neighborhoods. We're honored to have with us today three leaders of organizations that focus on preventing human trafficking in the United States. Our special guests today are Nick McKinley, founder and CEO of The Deliver Fund, Christian Murphy, CEO of Wellspring Living, and Jeff Shaw, National Expansion Officer of Frontline Response. So thank you all for joining us. You know, when I look around my neighborhoods, um, I never think that people can be trafficked uh, around me, that there might be in some house someone who is um, in in either on their way uh, to someplace uh, enslaved or held captive. I never think of that. Uh, Nick, Jeff, uh, Christian, could you just reorient my thinking? Because no matter where we live in the United States, it actually is happening. I mean, that's just a fact. Nick, you want to you want to start uh, start us off? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for having me here. And I think when we think about human trafficking in you know, traditionally, people tend to think about human trafficking as something that happens over there, right? It's in Cambodia, it's in Vietnam. It, uh, what I'm a I'm a big data nerd uh, and economics nerd. That's really uh, really what has driven me for you know almost almost 20 years. And before counter human trafficking, it was in counter terrorism. And so I always look at where the data points us. And when you look at the DOJ's data around hum the human trafficking cases that they prosecute, you find that over 85% of the victims of human trafficking in their cases are US citizens. Almost 99% of the customers, especially when we talk about the, the uh, trafficking within the commercial sex industry, are US citizens. And over 70% of the human traffickers are US citizens. So this is a very you American really problem. Important. You just said something really important, Nick. You said, the human sex industry, mm -hmm. right? So these human trafficking is actually serving industry sectors. There yes. are whole industries. Yes, yes. There's whole industries that are profiting from uh, from human trafficking, and I'm sure you know Christian could go into to uh, more detail around what that means for the the actual individual human. Because it, when we talk about human trafficking, we tend to think about it in terms of statistics, and it's the third or the fourth or the fifth largest illicit commodity. And right, we talk about it in these these grandiose academic terms, but we need to keep in mind that it actually is impacting the life of a of a very specific individual that God put on this planet. And I think that is. Uh, it's important to understand the academics of human trafficking because that's how we can actually fight it at the scale of the problem. But we need to keep in mind that what we're talking about is a human being who's being defrauded, forced or coerced in, into doing something, anything, providing usually a service or labor for the economic benefit of another person. That's that's what we're talking about. And that affects one individual at a time. So, um, Jeff, could you continue on this on this discussion? And then, Christian, I'd love for you to weigh weigh in in terms of what human trafficking is, and why people are being trafficked. What if 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 what's going on is that they are being coerced in some fashion, um, and then used to enrich someone else? Talk a little bit about the scale of the problem and its dimensions, please, Jeff. Sure. Well. I can put it in terms of what we see at Frontline Response, which is in the state of Georgia, we receive over 200 calls per month and we've served over 1700 women in 10 years that are exiting the commercial sex industry. And the stats, as Nick referred to, would indicate that the majority of those women, um, while society may look at them as leaving in a voluntary situation or industry would qualify under the legal definition of sex trafficking because there was the presence of force, fraud, or coercion in their adulthood, or if they're not an adult, it doesn't even matter if there was force, fraud, or coercion. By nature of being a child, essentially, we have said they they lack the ability to consent. So um, it is... 
I think when we talk about the proliferation of trafficking, especially in the U.S., as Nick alluded to, we have to look at systems like prostitution that are oppressive systems that uh, perpetuate violence against women and children, especially. There are male victims as well, and it's important to talk about them. But predominantly and globally, prostitution and sex trafficking are impacting women and children uh, much more. And so until I think we can continue to extract people from these situations, but until we start having on, honest conversations around uh, prostitution and pornography, especially, and how those contribute to the commodification and dehumanization of the individual, we're only going to continue extracting people and we're not going to change the underlying systems. Christian, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think that the startling reality is that this is a multi-billion dollar industry that to Nick's point and also to Jeff's point is pervasive in our own communities. I think any of us would be living in a fairy tale land to think that it's not happening here. We know that it's touched every zip code across the state of Georgia and likely countless others, of course, across the country. And so it really is happening here. There are many different issues that put people at risk um, and vulnerabilities is what we call them. People that um, may have experienced issues around um, poverty, um, homelessness, maybe they've had ex other experiences of physical or mental abuse in their households. And that makes traffickers find them as very susceptible and vulnerable to this issue. And so they really prey upon those vulnerabilities. It's not often the issue around um, the white van that's hiding into in the grocery store parking lot or your Walmart parking lot and looking to take people and kidnap them. It doesn't often look like that in the United States. It really does look very different. And that I think makes it harder to see or to suspect. We're going to come back to to that topic, and and we have to note that that uh, human trafficking does is not uh, solely restricted to the sex uh, industry. But mm -hmm. that was um, that was raised. Let's talk a little bit about about that because it's 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 kind of interesting what's going on right now, particularly in the world of online sales. Right, there are some some elements of that industry that are obviously voluntary, right? There are elements of that industry that are obviously uh, done on a business scale. You know, everything from the Kardashians to um, all these different websites that, that proliferate. Uh, Nick, how do you basically make the distinction between the use of those vehicles in voluntary ways and the use of those vehicles in ways that advance uh, trafficking? But I think we have to be very careful with the word voluntary. Uh, when we talk about, you know, poverty issues, we talk about drug addiction issues, um, you know, uh, uh, human smuggling issues, people who exist outside the system. Uh, are there people making choices? Sure. Are some of those people thinking it's probably the only choice they make? So if there's only one they can make, so if there's only one choice, is it truly a choice? I mean, these are these are very, very deep philosophical discussions we can get into. Um, but if we if we kind of bring it up a little bit a little bit higher to something we can discuss in this forum, what we're talking about is is uh, marginalized communities that are being oppressed by men with power. I mean that that it's it's that simple. And so I've I have heard uh, men, uh, you know, my my background obviously military special ops. CIA, you know, kinetic special unit, right? So like I have only really worked around men my entire life and some of the best and brightest warriors the world has ever seen. And what none of them did was exploit women. And when you see this, what we call voluntary, um, you know, there, there's usually circumstances that led to that quote unquote voluntary participation in the market. Usually you find that there is sexual abuse, usually by a man. Uh, you find that there is emotional abuse, physical abuse, right? All types of abuse that were done to these predominantly women by predominantly men. Uh, so we're talking about some major power differentials and uh, and people using that power differential to exploit other people. And there are no doubt people listening. Uh, right. They say one in 
where about 9% of American males have purchased commercial sex at some point in their lives. Um, I believe it's over uh, almost 50% of American males either dabble in or have an addiction to pornography, which is really kind of the gateway drug to what we see as a, uh, as a, you know, a voluntary act uh, that, uh, and that's without even getting into the strip clubs and and you know different types of of commercial sex that that happens. So when we talk about human trafficking. We need to understand that that there are people who, yes, like prostitution is a real thing. There are people who choose to, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and the, the reasons that we talked about earlier, choose to participate in that market, but they very quickly become vulnerable to becoming victims of human trafficking. And and so you have men who believe that they're, oh, I'm helping somebody get through college or I'm 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 really helping somebody get back on their feet. And to that, I push back and say, why didn't if you're if you really want to help them, then why didn't you just buy them a meal, give them a mentorship in your company? Uh, right. Invest in them in some other way. Hire them to mow your lawn, clean your house, clean your car, do something other than exploiting their bodies for your own gratification. And then when we talk about human trafficking as it relates to forced labor, very rarely have I seen forced labor cases that didn't also involve some type of physical abuse. And if it's a woman who is in that forced labor situation, it's usually sexual abuse. So, uh, Jeff, um, could you give us a little bit of a, a sense of how frontline response uh, takes this reality and tries to shift the reality for individuals? And then, uh, Christian, let's talk a little bit about recovery as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, our journey is is very linked to Wellspring Living, so it's fun to share this call together. But 13 years ago in 2011, um, really felt a, a calling from God to respond to people in the crisis of sex trafficking and and help them establish a bridge from that place of crisis to those places of healing like Wellspring Living. So we operate on the truly the front line of a 24 hour hotline that someone can call and say, I need help right away. This is where I am. Can you come and get me? And we dispatch a team immediately to go and physically pick them up from that location and then bring them into an emergency safe home that is staffed 24 hours and we intake around the clock. And we spend anywhere from three to four weeks triaging their urgent needs, whether that's medical, dental, psychological. And then what our hope is, is that as you know, these individuals are living in minute by minute survival mode. And so to ask them to make a long term decision for their future when they're in the fog of crisis isn't realistic. So what we want to do is bring them have, we are very low barrier. You can come drunk, high, pregnant, on your meds, off your meds, warrant out for your arrest. It, it really doesn't matter. You can come and land in a safe place. And then as those, you know, bottom level Maslow's hierarchy of needs are met and you're eating and sleeping, and then you begin to introduce choices that they can make with a lot more clarity about what they want for their future. And so oftentimes that looks like a placement into a, a program like Wellspring Living where, and, and I won't steal Christian's thunder from what their program offers, but that's where they can really begin to experience the therapy and life skills and job readiness to move to Toward independence and sustainability. So we operate in that crisis transition and triage space. So, and, and the important thing here is that you're it, you're operating in a in a non judgmental and non legally constrained way, right? If you were law enforcement, you would be constrained to intervene if you saw a crime being committed, drug use, as you said, um, and and other. Um, uh, issues, whereas what you're dealing with is the human being where they where they live, where they're coming with you, as you said, drunk or high or whatever their circumstances. You're focused on one thing, which is to extract that person and pla place them into a safe place so that they can start their road to recovery. Now, just staying with Jeff for a second, you actually see recidivistic 
issues, right? People who actually go through that cycle again and again and again, uh, sometimes never achieving the road to recovery and sometimes actually getting there. Does that uh, get your people um, uh, in their heart? How, how, do, how do they deal with that re-traumatization of themselves? Yeah, a really great question, Mark. So part of our training for staff and volunteers is on a model called the stages of change. And this has been used in different recovery types of programs, but it's understanding that an individual has to go through their own journey of before they're contemplating change, when they're contemplating change, when they're taking action, how they maintain that action, but then recidivism or relapse can be a step in that process. And we we are really big on saying that doesn't represent a failure, that represents a new opportunity. So when someone comes and they experience unconditional, non-judgmental love and care, and then they start to fantasize what they walked away from, whether it was substance use or the pimp or the trafficker who always said they loved them, maybe they shared a child together and they return to that unhealthy environment. Now they have a basis for comparison. Well, you're telling me you love me, but you're hurting me and you're taking from me and you're using me. But when I was with these people, it looked different and they talked different and they said different things about me. And so then, when because we always say when if someone decides to leave, you know how to get back in touch with us again. It's not a one chance and you're out policy. So we've had women as many as seven, eight times over the years come back into our home. And that's what we want to do. We want to be that place. We don't want Christian and her team, when they might have a woman who's a year into her recovery, having people come and go every day, but we can be that. We can buffer that process until they're ready to make that long-term decision. And we're, it, it does take a toll. It does hurt. We've sadly, we've had individuals pass away from an overdose or violence and, and that stays with you. Um, but all, but what we can say every day is we did our best today um, to show that person an opportunity and the, and all we can do is empower the choices that they make for themselves. Thank you so much about uh, describing sort of that that flow of 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 how treatment actually occurs and how intervention um, needs to be shaped specifically through an organization of your capability so that you can, bring people to people of uh, Wellspring Living's uh, capabilities. Christian, you want to take it from there? What what happens when somebody is referred to your organization? From, yeah, we are. Uh, an organization like Frontline Response. Definitely. So we are really grateful that there are organizations like Frontline Response to do amazing rescue and support work for immediate basic needs. Um, and what we do is we take them from there and try to help them focus in on their restoration. So we do that in kind of multiple different tracks. So I'll first talk about the work that we do for youth, understanding that we, uh, we serve youth as young as 12 years old, all the way up to age 17. We know that the average age of someone entering the life in our area is 14 years old. Um, that could be an eighth grader in some schools could be a ninth grader, but of course, understanding that this is someone whose brain is nowhere near fully formed. Um, someone whose emotional part of their brain is really the part that's that's been formed first. And so that I think also helps people to kind of prey on them in many different ways. But, but we have an immediate stabilization place called the Receiving Hope Center that supports youth all the way up to 90 days. And so it really can take them from the immediate crisis point to really helping them to find what are the basis levels for my foundation for support. And so we do everything from um, SANE exam, forensic interviews, medical exams, all of the gamut that is needed all in one place to also help reduce the opportunity that youth who are interested in running away, which is also very common. Um, we also have wraparound services such as therapeutic care, thanks to our amazing supporters and, part and volunteers. We also have um, a school on site so they can make sure that they can also kind of catch up in some ways as we try to kind of get a basis of what's their educational history look like so they can have a sense of normalcy within a safe place. From there, we also have a long-term girls residential program, um, which serves youth up to 13 years old. I'm sorry, up to 17 years, but up to 13 months. And so that includes some of the same components. We have everything from therapy, education on site, and a staff that is trauma-informed and strength-based in their approach to supporting youth. For women, we do also have a women's 
women's residential program that's in the Gwinnett County area that serves women up to 18 months. So again, those same kind of methods of support are really key there. And then we also have a community-based program, which is called the Women's Academy. That supports for the education and workforce development support for women. That's everything from GED support so they can get the degrees that they need to be successful in the workplace, but also working on the hard and soft skills that it takes to be successful in life. Um, and, and then finally, the final step of the Women's Academy is also um, our paid apprenticeship. We know that these women don't often have a resume that maybe they are proud of celebrating and sharing with others, but having a real in-person experience at great companies such as Delta, UPS, Accenture really can help them to find stabilization for their future, along with the wraparound services they need, such as housing vouchers or child care support. And so I think if you think about Wellspring in multiple different ways, I think I focus in on three key words. One, which is housing, making sure that people have a safe place to live. Housing the second, is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Housing, housing, housing. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's many issues around homelessness across our country. And I think that makes it a pervasive issue, of course, for those that we serve. The second is healing. We want to make sure that they have the support that they need to get to the root of the trauma and to do what we can to help them to kind of unwrap some of the things that they have learned about themselves or the things that they have been told about themselves to help them rediscover their dreams, their passions. And then the third area is around education. We know we need to have a, a viable future. You've got to have a sense of a strong educational background these days, and we want to make sure that we're supporting of them. The thing is, is that there's no cookie cutter approach to the work that we do at Wellspring Living. Every individual is truly seen as an individual, one that has potential, and one that we are trying to explore. What do they want to accomplish so that we can walk alongside them in their journey to success? So the, the three elements is stability, self-regard, and empowerment through knowledge, right? I mean, that's that's really important, right? If somebody has stability, mm -hmm. they have self-regard and they are empowered through knowledge, the likelihood of them being enslaved or trafficked is going to sharply reduce. Isn't that so, Christian? Yes, and I think too, we have to think about thoughtful transition plans. So making sure that we care for them, not only while they're here, but also help them as they're moving into their next chapter. Because when you're coming back into the community, you may be faced with some of the similar issues, whether it's same people, um, seeing the substance use that you were used to or, um, or other things that maybe have brought you down in the past. And we've got to help you think about how to navigate through that as well. And for children, that's also thinking, what's the right family system? How can we support the family if that's a safe place for them to be a part of thinking thoughtfully about what their future looks like together or other placement options so that people can really be adequately prepared to make sure that whoever is coming back into their household can be wholly regarded in this new self that they're still beautifully becoming. Nick, I want to talk a little bit about, about your own background and the whole issue of the pipeline of supply of people who are human trafficked that then Jeff needs to intervene with and Christian needs to help heal and, and, and all your folks. Um, we have a real issue, and I think it's connected to the whole disinformation issue that we're having in society. Mm -hmm. Using technology to drive... Um, income-producing uh, narrative, mm -hmm. um, income-producing activity that is nefarious, right? In other words, clicks and views on lies get more clicks and views than truth, because truth is unsexy, lies can be anything, right? It's the same thing with clicks and views that connect to sex and sexuality and, and all that, that, that stuff. And we have a a real old problem of the shield and the sword, right? I mean, you have people who have mountains of money uh, to invest in these online mechanisms for advancing these, these terrible purposes. How do you actually protect against that? Because you're not earning huge profits through the shield. In other words, Social media that is used for nefarious purposes is profitable. The The process of protecting people from those uh, nefarious purposes isn't. So you're cash starved and your opponents are not. What's going on here? How do we deal with that? 
so th those are all great issues and I'll try to knock them down kind of one at one at a time. Uh, so for, first is we have to understand why things happened. Uh, and so both Jeff and Christian have talked a lot about uh, choices and, and I got to just uh, just take a minute to to commend them both. Um, I work with, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of law enforcement agencies around around the U.S. Uh, we've got the largest database on human trafficking activity on the planet. And and so that brings me into connection with a lot of kind of the restoration side. And there's there's various models there. But but listening to the collaboration between Jeff and Christian and the way that we have an emergency needs, right, like get get warm and fed first, uh, get some sleep, then you can actually make decisions. Uh, and then there's a then there's a process for that, uh, that kind of collaboration in the the nonprofit community is exactly what I love to see. I don't deal with survivors, um, right? And so people uh, in the in the human trafficking fight, we talk about victim centric methodologies. Well, that only works for victims. I'm trafficker centric. I'm trying to hunt those people down on a daily basis and get them in into handcuffs uh, and behind bars where they belong, because that's true freedom for the victims. And that just then helps to facilitate the work that then Jeff and Christian are doing. So when we look around narratives, it's very important for us to understand that human trafficking is a market. And on one end, we have the we need to we need to restore the victims. But we also need to go after the trafficker because you cannot have a human trafficking victim if you do not have a human trafficker. And then we need to back up and go after the demand as well. Now, when you, we talk about the misinformation campaigns that happen, especially on social media, we need to understand that on the demand side, there's a scale problem. We're talking about the hearts of men, which we're not going to change the side of heaven. So we have to focus on the problems that we can solve as opposed to the problems that we cannot. And going after demand is essentially an unsolvable scale problem unless you and I'm going to get economic nerdy here, but unless you increase the deadweight loss in the supply and demand curve. And that's what we are ultimately focused on doing. So um the the social media platforms that exacerbate all of this. And, and I say that because when we look at the data and the best data we have comes from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It's not perfect, but it, they're a great organization. They do phenomenal work. And that is the best data we have just around youth commercial sex trafficking, right? Just the just the minor side of it. We found or they found that in just a five year period, they had an 800 hundred and forty six percent increase in suspected child trafficking cases. And when you look at why that happened, the reason is because we gave broadband connected microcomputers to children, put them on the Internet, and then the social media platforms added algorithms to them to help the predator find their prey. Now, that wasn't obviously, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or any of these people. That was not their intent. They don't get up every day trying to figure out how they're going to uh, uh, hurt it's children. The card companies, it's Facebook. It's, it's everybody. Google, it's Twitter. It's, it's everybody. We're all involved, whether we consciously are involved or not. Right? We, well, we are and, and companies are, but that's where we actually have to look to our politicians and ask them to do their job. Uh, we saw this with organized crime in the 80s and 90s where uh, and, and even before that, where we had uh, organized crime and the mafia and the mob and everybody was just out of control. We put anti money laundering legislation in place and it really brought it down significantly to a manageable level for law enforcement. Well, we need to see the same type of regulation around Communications Decency Act Rule 230 and different issues when it comes to uh, the online targeting of children, because that's what's happening. This is not, as Christian said, it's not the 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 white van with free candy rolling through a neighborhood trying to abduct children. And that's just because traffickers don't need to do that. That's too much work. And just to, to kind of make the math easy uh, within our conversation, it's a sales funnel for for traffickers. They know that they essentially have to communicate with 100 underage girls online to get 50 to actually speak to them, to get 25 to carry on somewhat of a conversation, to get 10 to carry on a meaningful conversation, to get five to do something they regret and agree to meet them, to get two to show up. So for them, 
and and the barrier to entry is so low they just need an internet connection and then they get their free social media accounts and then once they start actually trying to target these vulnerable populations, the algorithms within the social media platforms then help them find more vulnerable populations, right? And the, the, the system continues. So that's the bad news. What's the good news? The good news is that we understand why this works. We understand how this works. And very similar to the way that we learned to fight terrorism, we can fight human trafficking. Because if we, if we currently are really only asking law enforcement to fight human trafficking. I mean, that, that's what we what we currently do in, in society. And we start backing that up and we say, okay, hey, payment companies, now you have to, and banks, now you have to, and transportation companies, now you have to, and, 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 and. Well, now the cumulative mathematics of market disruption show that we can go from having a less than 5% chance of disrupting a human trafficking operation to a greater than 90% chance of disrupting a human trafficking operation. So let's talk a little bit, and since we're coming to the to the end of our time here, let's talk a little bit about that collaboration on the policy front. And let's stay with you, Nick. We'll go to Jeff and we'll let Christian have the last word. In terms of policy changes that, in a collaborative sense, um, this entire sector, the, the the sector that is dealing with human trafficking and those people in the business communities who might be profiting from this but don't want to. They don't mm -hmm. want to be um, a, a vehicle for that type of profitability. Uh, talk a little bit, Nick, and then we'll go to Jeff and, and Christian about the policy elements that you'd like to see enacted, the most important things that you would each like to see happen in your uh, part of America. Nick, let's start off with you. So I deal with policy a lot, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, it started with a bill called FOSTA-SESTA, uh, where I was intimately involved in the writing of that bill. And uh, that was the first uh, essentially chink in the armor of the Communications Decency Act Rule 230 and worked with a lot of uh, restoration homes and victim advocacy organizations and whatnot in, in writing that bill. What we need to what we need to as a community that fights human trafficking understand is that perfect gets in the way of progress. We will make incremental progress over time and we just need to all understand that we're not going to get what we want. Secondarily, what the companies, because we, we work with companies and we provide data to them to help them root out human traffickers, uh, many publicly traded companies. And what we find is that they all want to do something, but they want their competitors to have to do the same thing. And that's where regulation comes in, where we can, where Congress can come in and bring those players to the table and say, hey, we're going to have an accountability standard. This is what that standard is. We negotiate it out. We, we, we place it into law. And now all of those companies have to do the same thing. So they have an even playing field. You know, Airbnb doesn't want to have to spend a billion dollars fighting human trafficking if VRBO does not. Right. That's all they really want is the even competitive playing field. And from a policy perspective, it's very important for the, the anti and counter human trafficking communities to stop demonizing tech companies and and transportation companies and hospitality companies and to actually start working with them to help them find the human traffickers in their platforms and deny that territory to them. Thanks so much, Nick. Jeff, what, what is your most important policy initiative that, that you would like to see advanced on, on a local or a national front? Sure. Well, I'm going to piggyback Nick a little bit and because I think that Communications Decency Act, for people who don't know, um, that was passed when the internet was really just coming on the scene and nobody knew what to do with it, gave mm -hmm. a lot of companies immunity <clears throat> from liability for what was happening within their spaces. And so tightening that up and putting an affirmative burden that's equal, like Nick said, on companies to make sure their spaces aren't being used for nefarious purposes. We're something from a, a victim services side of things. And I think also um, dealing with demand is a, a model gets talked about a lot called the Nordic model or the, mm -hmm. the legislation that was introduced in Sweden initially. And what it does is it says we're going to take 
the people whose bodies are being bought and sold and we're going to decriminalize their conduct because we want to help connect them to services and resources but we're going to take the people who are making people available via pimping or trafficking and then the demand side the people who are purchasing and anyone else who knowingly participates in the exploitation of a person and we're going to make very serious penalties and consequences for them so that there's a very strong incentive not to participate in that activity and over time what the research has shown in sweden and in other places that have adopted this model is not only has trafficking decreased so substantially it's almost been wiped out but violence against women on the whole and Mm -hmm. sexual violence on the whole has decreased in those societies and so this is a model that is being pretty widely discussed across the u.s now i think you would probably have to look more like a state-by-state adoption versus a federal but that's that's all part of the policy conversation that's that's really interesting. So what you're saying is is that by by looking at how we perceive victims and uh, taking that to the fore, embedding that in law, these people are victims. They shouldn't be criminalized, right? Mm-hmm. And then shifting the burden to the demand side and also the supply side. Right, you're disrupting the market, which is one of Nick's uh, themes. Uh, Christian, what is your major policy focus um, for what you do, which is the recovery side? Yeah, I think Nick and Jeff said some really great examples. And I think the one thing that I'm really working on right now is how do we get inside school systems and classrooms where youth, where we can give more awareness and prevention opportunities so that they can be more properly educated. When we know that this is happening very often in social media chat rooms, it's also happening in gaming chat rooms as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So any places where our children feel like they are just able to be kids and have fun, that's where people are preying upon them. And I want to make sure that we're able to have a more thoughtful conversation with them younger. We already know that the entry level is age 14. Why are we not already having this conversation with fifth graders and middle schoolers about this issue? So they may know what is um, what is what is real healthy communication look like and what things should I alert my parents about or be concerned? I also want parents to know to be taking a look at those devices. Um, I happen to have a 13 year old at home and I kind of take it on a random moment. I um, mean, I think that's really important that we are playing more of a hands on approach to the support that we give our children, but also other kids in our community. And so really looking for ways that we can not only talk with kids, but also talk with parents about this issue. So we may quit denying that it's happening, but really own that there is something that we can do about it. And part of our commitment is to draw attention to these issues, to the work of of people like you, Uh, Nick McKinley, founder and CEO of the Deliver Fund, Christian Murphy, CEO of Wellspring Living, and Jeff Shaw, National Expansion Officer of Frontline Response. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, for providing us with your insights. And please thank your staffs, your boards, your funders, your constituents, and in particular, thank the victims who have the courage, the courage to change their lives and change society in the process. Thank you so much.